Tonight is a debate about first animals associated with our exhibition of, the, of that name. And it echoes, in a way, a, an event that happened that many of you will know about in 1860, when this museum opened on the 30th of June, 1860. And the University of Oxford uh, responded to the publication of On the Origin of Species by arranging a debate in a meeting of the British Association for the Advancement of Science to debate uh, the newly proposed theory of evolution by natural selection. And that debate, of course, was between the Bishop of Oxford, Samuel Wilberforce, and it was supposed to be uh, with Charles Darwin, but he was having one of his periodic illnesses, so he sent along his young acolyte, uh, Thomas Henry Huxley. And that debate uh, between Huxley and Wilberforce has become known as the Great Debate. And a few years ago, when we reopened after closing the, the museum to repair the roof, we decided that we wanted to take it back to being a place of debate. And we've done that every year since 2015, uh, addressing a variety of, of topics uh, often associated with the exhibition. So are smart drugs cheating? Um, what are the ethics of, of having your personal genome analysed? Um, and so tonight we, we come to, to first animals. Um, an exhibition that I should say has, has just been uh, extended till September. So, if we think of um, an animal-based ecosystem or a, an ecosystem in which there are lots of animals, we may be conjure up a, an impression like this, a highly biodiverse coral reef um, with a range of different groups of, of animals present. But we take it for granted that that's been the same for much of Earth history, and it's not true. It's a very recent phenomenon in Earth history. It's only for the, the past half a billion years or so, out of 4.5 billion, that we've had animal-centered ecosystems within the oceans or later uh, on land. And that's what we're going to debate tonight. Um, it's a question that was familiar to Charles Darwin, um, who, when he published On the Origin of Species, had a problem with the sudden appearance of fossils in the rock record. Uh, and he said that there's a, another an allied difficulty which is much graver. I allude to the manner in which numbers of species of the same group suddenly appear in the lowest known fossiliferous groups. That is, by his interpretation, there must already have been some evolution by the time the first fossils appear. Now, obviously, we know much more uh, about an event that's become known as the Cambrian Explosion, and that's what we're going to debate tonight. And we're going to address questions such as, what does that Cambrian Explosion represent? What's the evidence for the, the first animals? And accepting that there is a Cambrian Explosion, well, what's the trigger, if there is a single trigger for that? Was it uh, geological, was it ecological, uh, genomic, or geochemical, or a combination of all of those? Um, and so we've got four very distinguished speakers tonight to introduce the topic with, with short five-minute presentations, um, and then we'll, we'll get down to the debate itself. And I'll introduce them in turn just before their presentations. The first up uh, is Alison Daly, who's a paleobiologist. She is the epitome of an internationally mobile modern scientist. Um, <laughs> BSc and, and MSc in her, her mother country of, of Canada, PhD in, in Uppsala in Sweden, uh, then went to the NHM in London, then worked here uh, in the Department of Zoology and in the museum, uh, and is now Associate Professor in the University of Lausanne in, in Switzerland. She's a specialist in, in arthropod evolution, uh, particularly uh, a group I'm sure that we'll hear something about, the uh, anomala carids, and also in uh, aspects of paleoecology. So, uh, welcome, Alison. Right, here we go. Good evening, everyone. Uh, thanks very much for coming to this debate. And before I start, I just want to say thank you to the OUMNH for organizing this event, which I think is really something that's not happening too often in academia today. And it's a really lovely uh, original uh, event to have uh, this sort of debate. So thank you especially to Vanessa and Paul for the invitation. Um, so yeah, as, as Paul said, I'm Alison Daly. I'm from the University of Lausanne in Switzerland, uh, where I'm uh, studying 
essentially the Cambrian explosion from the perspective of the fossil record. Uh, so if it works here, we have an animation. If we were to go uh, snorkeling or, or scuba diving about 520 million years ago, uh, the seafloor might look something like this. This is an animation produced by Flash Bubble in Australia. Uh, showing the sort of diversity of animal life that we see already over 500 million years ago. Some of these aspects look very familiar to us. There's some sponges and things that look like algae and so on in the background that look a bit familiar to us, but also some bizarre creatures such as uh, the animal swimming through the middle of the screen there, Opabinia, with five eyes and a big trunk out the front of its head. Uh, some crawling, very heavily armored, mollusk-like creatures, uh, various swimming arthropods that we'll see in a moment. And uh, the research I'm doing in my lab is studying how these bizarre and wonderful creatures can help us uh, unravel the steps of evolution that led to the phyla, or the large groupings of animals that we see today. And we can really have a stepwise view of anatomical evolution by looking at these fossils. We can also learn about their ecology, so uh, people in my lab, we're studying some of these major, uh, these large predators, especially arthropods, so we're looking at uh, how their components to the ecosystems, they're actually quite abundant and numerous and well-preserved. Here we have a selection of fossils of very early arthropods or stem lineage arthropods, where we're trying to look at various features of their anatomy, their appendages, their eyes. We see similarities to modern arthropods, but also very different body construction. So we're trying to piece these together and work out the path of evolution that led to modern day crustaceans or insects, myriapods, this group of creepy crawlies and sometimes delicious creatures we see today. Uh, a question that occupies me in my lab is thinking about the timing of the Cambrian explosion. So not so much the causes, but what does this event actually look like? And I think that's something we, we probably will end up debating a bit this evening because uh, depending on how you see the Cambrian explosion, you're trying to explain a different event depending on how you see it. So you could, if these cones are sort of increasing animal diversity, with time down the side very simply expressed, this is the Precambrian and the Cambrian, uh, you could see the Cambrian explosion as an entirely Cambrian event, with the origination and the diversification of animals taking place uh, from about 540 million years onwards. Or you could think of it as having a deep Precambrian root. That means that maybe animals originated a bit earlier than the Cambrian and then uh, either diversified very rapidly, but we don't see this necessarily in the fossil record, or had an origination with not much diversification, with a major cone of, of, of uh, diversification happening in the Cambrian. Uh, so from the arthropod point of view, uh, in my lab we've been reviewing this recently. So this is a bit of a scary diagram, but I'll walk you through it. Essentially we have four types of fossils, trace fossils, so tracks and trails, body fossils preserved like the beautiful fossils I showed you before, um, uh, sort of uh, 3D preserved microfossils, again preserving bodies, uh, and various other types of microfossils. In green, we have a series of localities that essentially show us arthropod fossils for sure. And in the blue, we have localities with similar styles of preservation, but no arthropods are present. And we can see that the fossil record is telling us fairly clearly that there are no arthropods in the Precambrian rock record and abundant arthropods appearing in the Cambrian. So first you see evidence of their trackways, then you start to see evidence of crown group arthropods, trilobites, a very common fossil, and then you start to see their, their um, stem lineage preserved here in, in Burgess Shale type fossils. In this interval of time, we actually have several forms of fossils that we can use to investigate the Cambrian explosion more widely. Uh, and we can compare this to the Ediacaran rock record. So uh, BST preservation, which is essentially flattened animals in fine grain rocks. In the Cambrian, we see a huge diversity of animals. Similar preservation in the Ediacaran here shows essentially algae and no evidence of, of, you, arthro of you arthropods or in most cases animals, in my opinion anyway. Uh, in phosphatic microfossils, another form of preservation, we see beautiful arthropods preserved in the Cambrian and in comparable modes of preservation, no arthropods. We can see uh, some beautiful uh, fossil records that tell us about this interval, this transition from Ediacaran to, to Cambrian. So here in purple is the Ediacaran, the Precambrian, Cambrian in pink. 
This is showing diversity and disparity of trace fossils, so tracks and trails, with a massive increase, again, generally con ref uh, confined to the Cambrian, with not much going on uh, in these sources in the Precambrian. And then we have a huge, uh, beautiful rock record right through this transition of a variety of taxa and, and groups of animals, I'm sure, we'll, of organisms, I should say, uh, I'm sure we'll hear about throughout the course of the evening. So uh, the famous Ediacaran biota in the Precambrian, all sorts of small shelly fossils, so microfossils that actually span the interval, uh, and indeed trace fossils as well. So we have a nice rock record here, traces, microfossils, some bizarre Ediacaran biota, uh, ma macrofossils in the Precambrian, uh, before we even get up to these famous sites such as the Burgess Shale, Chenjiang biota, which all appear at 518 or younger. So this interval of time, the start of the Cambrian, is really, really important for understanding this event. And ultimately, from my point of view, uh, I would put a big uh, red X through these two models here, just to sum up as best I can in five minutes. Personally, I don't think there's a deep Precambrian root or diversification of animals starting very deep in the Ediacaran. I think it's a largely Cambrian uh, event uh, from the point of view of the fossil record and particularly you arthropods, uh, which I'm working on. And the causes of this event, uh, of course, are the subject of this debate, but you'll notice I've barely uh, mentioned it. So I guess as we go throughout the course of the evening, we'll talk about this event. But certainly, talking about an event that's confined to the Cambrian rather than one that has a deep Precambrian root. We're actually explaining two different things if we have these two different points of view. So I think it's uh, a point of the debate for the evening to look at these two models and talk about the timing and how that links to the causes and the many changes we're going to hear about, I think, from the other speakers going on at this interval of time. So. Thank you. Uh, thanks, Alison, for setting up the debate very nicely. Uh, our next speaker is Professor Phil Donoghue, uh, who's a, a scientist who really straddles the boundary between paleobiology uh, and the biological sciences. Um, and his research covers a very wide variety of groups. Uh, he started off in a truly obscure uh, part of the animal kingdom, working on a group of microfossils called conodonts, uh, a passion that we happen to share. Um, then extended that research into looking at early vertebrates and the origin of vertebrates, fossil embryos, molecular clocks, uh, the origins of major groups, etc. Um, he is currently at the University of Brest Bristol, where he's professor of, of paleobiology. Uh, he's won awards and medals in abundance uh, and is a fellow of the Royal Society. Phil. So Paul used to be my boss, and he's saying such nice things about me. It's unbelievable. <laughs> uh, so thank you, Paul, and thank you, Vanessa, for the, all the amazing organization tonight and for the invitation, despite you know, people having knowledge of my track record and everything else. Uh, and I had time also this evening to go and look at the exhibit, which many of you will have seen already. If you haven't, make sure you do look at it uh, tonight or uh, later in the week. It's an amazing display. I've never seen uh, this archive, fossil archive of early animal evolution from all around the world, all in one place before. So it really is a treat, even if you, you stare uh, puzzlingly at some of the serious passive fossils, trying to work out what's actually a fossil there at all. You're honoured, believe me. Right, okay. So, uh, so we're here discussing where all this came from, where animal diversity came from. These are all the animal body plans, the fundamental body plans, and they're defined almost on the basis of ignorance, on the basis it's very difficult to resolve uh, homologous or similar features of the anatomy between an annelid, say, and a, a priapulid worm, right? So these are the, the, the fundamental units of, of uh, if you like, animal design, which emerged sometime uh, deep in, in Earth history. And, and what I want to address is the question, as Alison did, uh, as to when that happened. So the answer to that should be really, really simple, right? So we look in the fossil record, there are all these wonderful uh, sites of exceptional fossil preservation, and we can trace the origin of those body plans, the origins of those phyla in the fossil record, at least as far back for the majority of them to the middle Cambrian or uh, the early Cambrian. So to around uh, 515 to about 
535 million years before present, right? So surely that's when they evolved. So what I want to argue is that that's not the case. Uh, and, um, and by definition, when you find the oldest fossil, what it tells you only is that that's when that evolutionary lineage, uh, that's the minimum age uh, for uh, the origin of that evolutionary lineage. By definition, it must have evolved earlier. And the reason why is that when lineages evolve, when they say when one phylum splits uh, from its sibling phylum, from a common ancestor, that, that's a, a phenomenon that happens within population genetics. In terms of what we see in the fossil record, we can't see that at all. We can only see evidence of one phylum splitting off from its ancestor that it's shared with its sibling phylum when um, one of those descendant lineages has evolved some sort of feature in its anatomy that distinguishes it from its sibling lineage and indeed from its ancestor as well. And not only that, that feature which it evolves to distinguish it from its sibling and its ancestor has to be a feature which is fossilizable. And so there's always going to be a time lag between uh, when that, ev when that evolutionary divergence event occurs when phyla split from each other successively uh, through time and when we see evidence of it in the fossil record. And constraining the interval of time between the origin of these lineages and when they appear in the fossil record is really, really hard. Okay, we can get some clues as to whether the fossil record uh, is a, a, a close or uh, a less close approximation of the true time scale of animal evolutionary history by plotting the, uh, on these blue bars the known fossil record of these lineages. Okay, so here's a time scale, uh, geological time that extends back to the early Neoproterozoic, uh, and these times, these numbers at the bottom, are millions of years before present. At the tips, we have all of the animal phyla, all of those fundamental body plans. And the black lines represent the, the family animal tree of life, if you like. And we can see uh, that some of these lineages, like brachiopods and bryozoans, are more closely related to each other. They share an, an ancestor to the exclusion of other lineages. Right? So the important thing about this diagram is it tells us which lineages are sibling lineages, which ones split off from each other at, at the same time. Uh, what we should expect, since they split from each other at the same time, we should expect their fossil records to be equal. But some of them, that's conspicuously not the case. If we look at uh, nematodes and nematomorphs, which are kind of obscure but very diverse and abundant uh, worms, we can see that although they must have diverged from each other at the same time, their sister lineages, uh, one has a fossil record that's 200 million years older than the other, even though we know they must be of the same age. And indeed, if we compare the, the nematode plus the nematomorph lineage to its sibling lineages, lineage, which is all of the arthropods and their relatives, again, we see that there is, there is a gap there that must be at least 150 million years in duration. So there's some intrinsic evidence that the fossil record is not a perfect archive of evolutionary history. Another aspect is that if we consider not just the phyla themselves, but the ancestral lineages from which these phyla diverge from each other deep down to the origin of animals themselves, while there are some fossils which we could attribute to some of these branches lower down in the tree, there are no fossils to populate any of these other branches. There is some systematic bias which has led to an absence of fossils to occupy these branches. And I would posit it's because, by their very nature, they were, they were not fossilizable. Okay, so what is the extent of the gap between the fossil record of animals and the true time scale uh, of the origin of their lineages? It's a really, really hard problem. Many of us in the room uh, uh, who, who have worked on this disagree quite fundamentally uh, and we all have uh, very uh, good data supporting our different views, okay? But they are essentially the same data that we're all trying uh, to reconcile. So some people have it that all of the bilaterian animals, so all of those that have primitively at least a plane of mirror image symmetry running down through the mid-axis of their body, in terms of their body plans, which is almost all of animals, 
Uh, many people believe that their emergence is confined to the Cambrian and uh, that the more primitive lineages like cnidarians, corals, uh, sponges may have emerged late in the Ediacaran, just before the Cambrian, perhaps at about 570, 560 million years before present. Other people posit that actually these lineages may extend hundreds of millions of years before the Cambrian. And others suggest that there may be some sort of in-between, right? But all of these, you know, th there is data to, to support all of these alternative views. So how can we try to reconcile them? So the way that I and others have tried to reconcile them is using a methodology called the molecular clock, which combines, it's an integrative method that uh, tries to constrain what we can understand about the genetic differences between living lineages to geological time using fossil evidence. So it integrates all of the evidence and tries to come up with a, a holistic uh, timescale for um, evolutionary history. And it, it's based on just a small number of very simple assumptions, which, are, uh, like all assumptions which are simple, are beguiling me so. So it's based on, uh, if you compare the same genes in different species, you'll observe that there are differences in those gene sequences, and they are a consequence of mutations, right? And if you count up the numbers of differences in those gene sequences by, between different evolutionary lineages, the number of differences that you see are a reflection of how long it's been since those lineages last shared a common ancestor. If there's very few, they shared a common ancestor relatively recently. If there's loads and loads, then they must have a, a, a very deep ancestry. They must have separated long ago. If you can work out when at least one of those pairs of lineages separated from each other, you can take those, that numerical estimate of the genetic difference between lineages and convert it to a, a, a rate a molecular rate of evolution. And once you have that, you can do some work. You can estimate the, the time of divergence between other pairs uh, of lineages. Yeah, by extrapolation, you can use that mutation rate to establish an overall time scale for all of the, the beasties that you consider. This is the result of a molecular clock study that, that we've done, uh, and it's, it is biological evolution scaled to geological time, which is a prerequisite, I think, to trying to uh, reconcile different competing views on what caused, for instance, the emergence of animals. And the way you should read it is not the position of where these branching events occur, but in terms of these, these blue bars, which are the uncertainties in terms of the estimates. Okay, so for some of these, the uncertainties are very, very large. They're hun hundreds of millions of years in extent, but for some of them, they're really, really short. They're very, very precise, okay? Uh, and generally what this diagram shows is that there is good agreement between the fossil record and molecular clock estimates. What it suggests that for the phyla themselves, at the very least, that the, that the phyla emerged sometime within the late Ediacaran, the early Cambrian interval, which suggests only a short uh, mismatch with the fossil record. But it suggests for, for the, the deeper ancestors, for which I've suggested that there is no fossil record, it suggests uh, that they diverged deeper within the Ediacaran or even uh, within the Cryogenian. And so your bilaterian ancestor, the ancestor of all bilaterally symmetrical animals, would have emerged sometime between the middle Cryogenian and the, the middle Ediacaran. So uh, between about 650 and maybe about 570, um, something like that. So overall, what it's suggesting is that the Cambrian explosion of animal diversity was perhaps not Cambrian, and perhaps not an explosion. Uh, good, well, we have the basis for a debate from the first two talks. Uh, let's see where we go from here. Uh, our next speaker is Professor Peter Holland, who's the Lineker Professor of Zoology in the Department of Zoology, Fellow of, of Merton College, ex-head of the Department of, of Zoology. He's best known for his work on evolutionary developmental biology, uh, particularly the role of, of homeobox genes uh, in animal evolution. And you'll see uh, part of the exhibition uh, uh, discusses that, that aspect of, of first animals. Um, he's a recipient of, of many academic awards and again, a fellow of the Royal Society and a very distinguished uh, speaker in the field. So, Peter.
Well, I'm not going to talk very much about timing, which the other two speakers have talked about. I want to talk a little bit about, more about potential mechanisms, although I might get carried away and mention timing. So we'll see how, it, see how it goes. So I first want to introduce you to the idea of genes and embryos and the sorts of ways in which um, animal embryos have similarities and differences from each other. And what makes animals' embryos rather special? And what are the genes that build those animal embryos? If you look at this picture here, it sort of says something rather obvious, which is if we work from the right-hand side moving across, we have animal diversity over here. Think about animal body plans, how animals are put together. And of course, how the animal is put together is built by the embryo. Where, how, the cells that have to divide, they have to build a shape, and those cells have to build particular structures. What's telling the cells to do that? It's the genes that they have in their body. So genes build embryos, embryos build animals. Let's look at some of those genes. Well, the genes that are building the bodies of animals are really special. There's, really, there's a huge number of these different genes, and they do a lot of really interesting things. So the example I've put on the left-hand side there are cells signaling to other cells. Of course, animals are multicellular organisms, and the way they pattern their bodies is they have specialized molecules which they send to other cells. Those cells receive them, and they interpret those signals. What do they do with those signals? Well, all sorts of different things. But one thing that's really key is that cells need to know where they are in the embryo. Okay, think of it like a sort of postcode where that cell needs to know where it is and then it can turn into the right things. And there's a couple of different examples I've put up here. There's a famous set of genes called Hox genes, which tell cells where they are along the body from the head to the tail, primarily in, in structures like the nervous system and many in other internal parts of the body. There's a less, no, less well-known group of genes called parahox genes, which do something similar in the gut. And there's another group of genes called NK genes, which pattern parts of the muscles and the mesoderm and telling them whether it's a heart, heart muscle or, or, um, or different sorts of uh, muscle. Those are really actually interesting sorts of genes. And they're arranged in interesting ways in the, in the genome. Many of them are arranged in clusters along chromosomes. And I thought I'd illustrate that I'm going to turn myself into an embryo now. <laughs> Here's one I prepared earlier. So if you want to try to understand how these things work, imagine I'm, a, imagine I'm an embryo, and I will move forward and move the microphone. hope you can still hear me. If I was an embryo, then the signals are, t are telling the cells in the body where, where they are, and then in response to those signals, different cells are going to switch on different sorts of genes. For instance, this gene here in blue is a gene called HOX1, and that's going to be expressed from here backwards, HOX2 from there backwards, HOX3, etc. They're expressed in different regions, and the cells can read off what they've got switched on in them. And by that, they can work out where they are and do the right thing. I'm not sure what I'm going to do with this piece of paper. So, so what's that got to do? Um, with evolution? Well, I think the sort of questions we need to address are these, are these ones here. We want to look at how those genes originated and when they originated in terms of animal evolution. So how did they originate? We know a lot about how genes evolve. We know that genes, um, new genes can come from old genes by gene duplication. We know that genes can fuse and create new genes. We know that non-coding genes, non-coding DNA, which doesn't code for a gene, can gradually change and become a gene. So there are all sorts of mechanisms which are well understood. But to work out when those special animal genes arose, we have to compare between species. And I just want to, there are many people who have tried to do this, and I just want to very quickly show one set of data that um, my colleague Geordie Paps and I put together a few years ago, where we took a whole bunch of complete genome sequences from across the animal kingdom and we computationally extracted all the putative genes from those sequences and compared everything with everything. And then you can work out which animals have got what. And this tells you when genes arose. And the sorts of things we learned from this, this is a tree there. I just want you to look at, let's zoom in on a couple of things. What, one thing that we discovered is right at the base of the animal kingdom, if you like, on what we would call the stem lineage of the animal kingdom, the, the branch leading to all animals, more than, more than a thousand new genes originated on that branch. These are genes that didn't exist before. 
and they include in that lots of genes which are being used to pattern embryos. But also, and I don't think we should forget this, there's also more than 1,500 new genes that originated on another branch, which is the branch leading to the bilateria, the bilateria of that group with the, with the mirror image plane of symmetry, left-hand side, right-hand side, front and back, top and bottom. These are animals which explore the world in three dimensions, 99% of the diversity of animal life today. Lots of new genes arose, and they include many of those genes that I've just talked about, which are involved in patterning the embryo. So, how does this relate to the Cambrian explosion? What I've tried to show you um, is, relates to the genes themselves. But if we think about what was happening in the Cambrian, what it really looks like in the fossil record is that a 2D world became a 3D world. By a 2D world, I mean a world dominated by mats-like fauna and algal mats and other, other living forms which were living on the surface of structures. But once we get into the Cambrian, we can see mixing of sediments, we can see burrowing, we can see also many more evidence of more activity bulldozing through the sediments. And what we see in the fossilised forms of the Cambrian are animals that could burrow, mix up sediments, crawl, swim, chase their prey. We're really talking about those animals um, which explore the world in three dimensions. We're talking about those animals which have had these new genes, genes which tell cells where they are, new genes which build bodies with a front and a back and a left and a right and a top and a bottom. And what I'm trying to argue is that once this way of building a body had been pieced together, these new genes have been used and their new regulatory principles have been put together to build a body of this type, rather like ours or a worm or a snail, something with the front and the back and the left and the right. This just opened up so many new possibilities for ways of life um, around the animal kingdom. It's really striking that all the bilaterian animals on the planet today use those same sorts of genes to do this. So my argument is that once those genes originated, life set off in an explosion in many of those different lineages as animals diversified and used this toolkit of genes to build their bodies in lots of different ways. Okay, thank you. Uh, thanks very much, Peter. <laughs> Exits with prop. <laughs> well, we're going to take a different tack now, and our, our next speaker is Professor Ros Rickaby, who is the newly appointed uh, Chair of Geology in the Department of Earth Sciences. Uh, she was previously in the department there as the Professor of Biogeochemistry. Uh, she did a PhD at Cambridge uh, postdocs in Harvard, and her research looks at the intersection of biological and chemical processes, particularly in relation to natural systems, uh, and particularly in relation to phytoplankton in, in oceans. She's interested in, in biological innovation um, over the course of Earth history, and hence her interest in uh, the Cambrian explosion, whatever that might be. And she's co-authored a, a book called Evolution's Destiny, co-evolving chem the chemistry of the uh, environment and life. Roz. Okay, thank you very much. It's a, a huge pleasure uh, to be here, part of this debate, and I'm afraid I, I took it as a sort of competition, actually. I was, I was, uh, I apologise. I've, I've been rather bombastic with my, my preparation because I, I want to convince you that, that chemistry is the source of this explosion. Uh, after all, chemistry is, is really what life is. We're, we're just chemistry in some kind of organised way. So I'll apologise to my fellow speakers who've been a bit more subtle with their perspective of arguments. <laughs> um, and I guess I, I wanted to, to, to make the point about evolution, perhaps in the Earth history, that whenever evolution occurs and whenever there is perhaps a radiation and we think of the fact that the winner, perhaps, in this evolutionary arms race changes at that time, that we need to consider that in the context of the environment and perhaps in the context of the chemistry of the environment. So here we've got a, 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 a rather buff uh, a, a chap who's being told that 
really he's he's not going to win in this world of video gaming tournaments because he really just doesn't have the genes. So this is trying to make this argument that competition depends on what game you're in and, and that that game can change as the environment changes. So there will be changing winners to the survival of the fittest. Um, I just wanted to mention the sort of two physiologies. I'm afraid I'm not very biological in the animal sense. I, I think more about single cells and plankton. But to me, the Cambrian explosion is very much about M's. It's about multicellularity, mineralization. And, and so I was trying to think, well, in terms of chemistry, uh, what are we actually, what are, what, are we, um, what are the drivers for becoming multicellular? What are the drivers for becoming mineralized? Those are the two sort of obvious components that contribute to this explosion in the geological record. And the two sort of bits of chemistry, this is, this is now just looking perhaps at environmental change, let's say, through this Cambrian explosion and some of the more obvious markers of the changes in complexity as we trek through this time period between whatever that is, 680 uh, and 520 million years. We've heard arguments for fossils of, of uh, evidencing change exactly at this Cambrian explosion. We've heard the genes perhaps putting the roots of this somewhat further back. We have biomarkers suggestive of sponges, some of the earliest animals uh, uh, in the fossil record around here, although their, their origin has been questioned uh, in papers last year. Um, and then we have this evolution towards these mineralizing organisms as we go into the Cambrian. And a really nice marker of the environment is the, the delta C13 of carbonate. So this is just an isotopic marker, uh, really, of the burial rates of limestone versus organic carbon. And that actually can tell us something about the environment. And what the point to, to make from this is that actually during this period of time where we have these apparent changes in complexity, we seem to have an incredibly dynamic environment. We've got these big oscillations in this isotopic marker of the environment. And we can sort of argue about how to interpret these, but it's clear that it's a very dynamic environment. This is it's sort of globally reflective of ocean chemistry. And often this is interpreted in the sense of the degree of oxygenation of the ocean, i.e. how much oxygen is dissolved in the ocean and how is it distributed. And this is one interpretation of the oxygenation of the ocean through that time, these OOE events are when we have we think full oxygenation, these periodic and perhaps sporadic uh, uh, oxygenation events. But at other times, I guess it's very much worth noting that particularly as we come into this Cambrian explosion, we think the deep ocean still remains anoxic, has very small amounts of oxygen uh, 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 dissolved in it at that time. And that can make it a fairly hostile place for animals that perhaps have high metabolic requirements for energetic lifestyles. So it could be that this change in oxygenation, you see these black mid-depth deep oceans transitioning to becoming uh, uh, better oxygenated as we go through this time scale. And you might imagine that that could have some impact on uh, the life that can live there. And indeed, this is just a little schematic to show you through a modern oxygen minimum zone. There are still parts of the ocean today which are not fully oxygenated. And indeed, if you look at this sort of diversity realm, as we go into the oxygen minimum zone, you can see you tend to decrease the diversity of the animals that are able to live in these very low oxygenated environments. Interestingly, we also see mineralization correlating with this diversity in the sense that we tend to have organisms that can be mineralized in these uh, uh, more oxic zones, both above and beneath the oxygen minimum zone. But as we go into these uh, oxygen minimum zones, we tend to find non-skeletal benthos living there. So there seems to be, at least in the modern day, a real link between this degree of oxygenation and both diversity 
uh, and this potential for mineralization. And we can argue about the potential uh, links here. Is this relate to predation? Predation itself as a mode of life requires high amounts of, of oxygen to be energetically uh, 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 trying to capture animals. And so there are some arguments that this low oxygen is, is, is exclusive of predators. And perhaps that contributes to, the, to this uh, lack of mineralization in the oxygen minimum zones if you don't need skeletons, if you don't need defense against predation. So my, my point in this slide is we have a highly dynamic uh, 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 oxygenation of that water column during this time with overall a trend towards increasing oxygenation. There are also hints of other changes in the seawater chemistry. This is now just a, a plot of, I'm afraid, of a horrible different isotope system, the strontium isotopic uh, 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 composition of the ocean. And it's, uh, I just want to show this, it's a proxy really for the relative inputs of ions coming in from uh, continents into the oceans versus ions that are being leached out of ocean basalts at hydrothermal vents. And the higher you go on this graph, the greater the input of ions from continental weathering. And related to that then is the saturation state of the ocean. If we pour more ions into the ocean from the continents, we actually increase the saturation state with respect to calcium carbon. And so there is some suggestion that this is actually an increasing saturation state as we come into this uh, uh, period of increasing diversification. And indeed, we perhaps have the highest saturation states as we see shelled fossils emerging. And that might make sense that we've got the ingredients for mineralization there. So we're sort of, I'm trying to show you that there are indeed seawater chemistry changes and oxygen changes that are accompanying this change in diversity and one might argue at least changing the context for animals that were perhaps living there and, and giving different winners the chance to, to win. But I also want to come on to a slightly more nuanced chemical driver that could be at play in the background here. And this links to very simple chemical uh, equilibria. We can actually make predictions for some of these trace elements, which are rather key for life and how they've changed their ability through, uh, availability through time. This is a, a, a model that is trying to show predicted change in chemistry. And here I'll just focus. This is the sort of period that we're talking about, the 600 to 500 million years ago or so. And you can see stark changes in our chemically predicted uh, uh, elements in the ocean. So things like iron, this is, we, we know this fairly well. Iron drops out through this period in banded iron formations. It becomes insoluble in an oxic ocean. As we increase the amount of oxygen, iron oxidizes to these oxyhydroxides and drops out of the ocean and becomes vanishingly low in terms of its availability in the ocean. By contrast, if we look at zinc and copper, these are two elements of which are almost vanishingly available in the very ancient ocean. They're locked up in insoluble sulfides in continents. If anything gets into the ocean, it is scavenged away into these, these sulfides. And these elements are totally unseen by life really until about this time of the, of the Cambrian explosion, when they're oxidized, the sulfides become oxidized, and those copper and zinc ions have become available in the ocean. So this is a chemical prediction for a change. But what's curious is that actually we can look into the proteomes of different organisms. And I'm afraid I'm going to show you plankton here. I will show you some animals in the, in the next slide. But if we look from the cyanobacteria, and I'll, I'll point out why this is key in a minute, going into eukaryotic phytoplankton, so cyanobacteria, very simple cells, coming onto the eukaryotes, these, these uh, multi-compartment cells, so now we're just going to the single cell level. But we can look at their genomes, and we can predict from their genomes, looking at the metal binding proteins, what their metal requirements are as we go from cyanobacteria to eukaryotic algae. And we see changes in the chemistry. Things like zinc are very much more required in these eukaryotic algae than they are in cyanobacteria. We see a decrease in the requirement for iron. 
We see an increase in things like molybdenum, a decrease in cobalt, and these are all the chemical changes that we would predict from an oxygenation around about this time being reflected in the metal requirements in the proteome of these organisms. <laughs> What's intriguing is going into the fossil record that we see a change in dominance indeed from these bacteria to these eukaryotic algae as we go across this key period of evolutionary change. The bacteria dominate. This is looking at, at biomarkers of their existence. So the bacteria dominate with these uh, chemical signals of low oxygen in the environment. And as we increase the oxygenation, change the metal availability, these eukaryotes start to take over. So it's clear that there is a chemical change impacting the metal requirements of the life, and the metal requirements of those life are then giving them a competitive advantage in this newly oxygenated environment where they're making use of metals that are newly available. And we can even see this in the, in the genomes of uh, 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 more complex life. So just to show this increased use of copper and zinc, uh, uh, this is looking here at the proteome and the number of, of, of copper uh, enzymes uh, from this proteome. And you can see you go from archaea, bacteria, going up to much more complicated organisms. You massively increase the use uh, of copper, these EC1 proteins, which are, which are copper proteins. And we see this same trend in the zinc proteins. If you go to the very simple organisms, archaea, bacteria, suddenly you get to the eukaryotes, and they have a much higher proportion of their proteome dedicated to the to the use of zinc. So there are sort of arguments that actually chemistry held back evolution. Copper and zinc are both necessary for becoming multicellular. They are used in messaging systems that Peter has talked about. Intracellular messaging systems rely on copper and zinc uh, uh, enzymes. They're also involved in extracellular matrices, allowing cells to bind together, to cut, and then to expand. And so this is, this is potential that this chemistry is driving the plankton, but it's also driving evolutionary innovation such that you require these metals to become multicellular and more complex. Whoops. And just a, a final link to sort of link this plankton evolution in addition to the animal evolution, that as you go to these larger cells, the eukaryotic algal cells, they sink more effectively through the water column and are a much better food source for animals living on the sea floor and essentially transfer more of that sunlit energy down in food form to animals living on the benthos. So there's a higher uh, uh, transfer of energy from the, the, across the trophic levels, and that could potentially also afford these animals the opportunity to become complex, to start to move, and to start to mineralize, to have the extra energy that they can invest in, in forming a skeleton. So in the end, it comes down to chemistry and plankton. And I'll leave it there. Thank you. So we've, we've heard four very contrasting views, and uh, I'll, I'll just start off with a couple of questions and then we'll open it out to the audience. So I think, Phil, you were the most agnostic in, in, as to whether the Cambrian explosion was, was a, a real event, and then we heard uh, three very different views of it. So I, I'd like to start off with a simple question. Is the Cambrian explosion real? And if so, what does it represent, Phil? Uh, so, so for me, it's really hard, right? Because because I, I fondle fossils as much as anybody else does, and and I'm kind of incredulous of the fact that you know I work on a fossil deposit at the moment that's that's within three million years of the base of the Cambrian, and it's already got mollusks and it's got various groups of of uh, panarthropods in there, uh, as well as cnidarians and, and other lineages. And, um, and it seems to me incredulous that, they, that uh, you can fit all of animal evolution into that three million years, right? Um, but then you go into the, the Precambrian and there are various fossils that go back to about 575 80, which many people believe are representative of the earliest branches of animal evolutionary history. But the, fo the rock record, the, the fossil record is silent about what goes on in between. And, and to me, it's, it's almost a, a paradigm that we have to, or, or a philosophy, that it all has to be fit into the Cambrian. And I, I don't really see uh, why that has to be the case. 
you know, uh, um, to me, the fossil record begs that there is a prehistory, but, it, but being a fossil fondler, I do worry about the fact that I don't find any animal fossils um, in, the, in the Ediacaran, or at least early bilaterians. And, and indeed, I've spent the last 15 years uh, basically going from one fossil group to another, proving that there are no bilaterians or, or um, animals in the Ediacaran. Uh, so it's hard. Yeah. Okay. <clears throat> so uh, I, I think, Ros and Peter, you offered two very different views of, of a real event, in, in essence. And, and I suppose the question is, is, can your respective views be reconciled? Can the chemistry uh, be reconciled with, with the genomics? Um, um, to you next. Well, if I, if, I, if I can start, and then Ros can yeah. respond to my suggestion. I, I think they might be completely reconciled because I think a lot of what we were hearing about with the chemistry, particularly with zinc and copper, might be real drivers of eukaryotic life and multicellularity and maybe the very early stages of animal evolution. Whereas I was really focusing on new genes and new genetic pathways which were building the bilaterian animals. So that's a little bit, a step a little bit later. And to my mind, um, we see the really big and conserved um, genetic organising principles applying to the bilaterians, when perhaps the chemical changes might affect a slightly earlier stage. But I'll, I'll wonder what you think about that. I, I mean, I think the, the, the true challenge for us is, is knowing the point at which the metals change. Currently, the, the, an independent record of when copper and zinc change their availability is not forthcoming at the moment, actually. Mm. We don't have a well-dated record of that particular seawater chemical change. And I think the, 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 the best evidence, in a way, almost comes from these proteomes and, and, and seeing the, the, the differences between the bacteria and the eukaryotes. And if we can have faith in the biomarker evidence for that changing dominance between the cyanos and the eukaryotes, then I think you're right that the metal changes are somewhat earlier and, and your Hox genes can very validly a, a occur later on. Could I, could I make a suggestion, which is if, if there's evidence in the proteomes of how many metal binding proteins there are in different groups, uh, over the past few years, many, many more genomes have been assembled. It should be possible for somebody, us, to go back, to actually go and start analysing that at a finer scale, yeah. scale of detail um, to see whether we see dramatic changes in, in metal binding proteins as we move through the animals. That could be the first research grant to come out of a museum <laughs> debate. <laughs> Excellent. Uh, Ali, I, th I think your, your view is, is you're quite a, uh, diametrically opposed to Phil's in terms of quite a literal reading of, of the rock record. How, how would you take... Uh, that, that view that, um, that there, there must be a, a, a fuse, or at least how do you explain uh, Phil's point about the, you know, the, the rapid, uh, or the, the, the appearance at, at the base of the Cambrian um, of, of a multiplicity of groups that, that must have a, a missing fossil record? So uh, I would say to that that there is still a fairly immense amount of time we're dealing with here. Uh, did animals evolve exactly at the base of the Cambrian at 541? It could go back, say, as far as maybe 550. And what we see looking at the trace fossils um, and small shelly fossils, we see it, an increase in complexity that's taking place in the, say, bottom 20 million years of the Cambrian. So if it's from 550 till the time we see complex ecosystems already in the, the first Burgess Shale type biota, the Chenjiang at 518, we're still talking about uh, you know, 30 million years of time. It's, it's a lot of time for evolution to take place. Uh, indeed, I don't think that uh, animals could evolve, uh, you know, at, at 680 million years, and then we don't see phyla until the Cambrian. So Phil showed the, the molecular clocks that suggest the phyla all appear in the Cambrian, um, which I think we, do, we sort of agree with, and everything you said about the rock record when you, when you started is, is simply true. We, we have amazing preservation windows in the Ediacaran, and we don't see convincing evidence of animals everywhere. It's not a lack of rocks, and it's not a lack of fossils. Uh, molecular clocks inspired us, um, us being the broader us of paleontology and geology as a community, to really search in Ediacaran rocks. And 
and look for any evidence of animal life. And time and time again, we're seeing the windows were open, animals aren't being preserved. So if, if uh, early animals that hadn't yet evolved into phyla that we can recognize today were around, uh, even if they were small or soft-bodied or uh, huge and, and mineralized, all those windows are open. And we just don't see them in the mm. rock record. Mm. So I wouldn't say that we have to read the rock record completely literally. Of course, there's going to be ghost lineages where something evolves. We're not going to get the very first individual of a new species preserved in the rock record. But I just don't see the need to go so far back, even before the Ediacaran, 150 million years um, to go that far back. Yeah. Okay. Um, I want to open the floor to, to questions. Um, I've got a few tucked up my sleeve in case you go mysteriously quiet. Um, just one caveat. Um, firstly, we're, we're recording, so uh, please uh, wait for a, a roving mic to, to come to you. But also, please bear in mind when you're asking the questions, I'm very conscious that this is a very diverse audience of people with all sorts of different backgrounds. Um, from people who live and breathe the Cambrian explosion from nine in the morning till nine the following morning, um, uh, through to people who have a passing interest. So uh, please ask the, the questions um, using non-technical terminology. Thanks very much. First question. I was wondering if you guys could talk a bit more about the cryostain evidence uh, for, for potentially for early sponges. I know there was, uh, that's, so there's just some biomarkers from like during the snowball earth period before, uh, before the Cambrian, before the Ediacaran that uh, suggests that sponges might have been around at that time. But then recently there's been debate on that because I think rhizarians were found to produce the right kind of uh, molecules, but they might not produce them in the right ratios or something. I was just curious about you folks' uh, informed opinions on this. Like, do you think the cryostains are good evidence for early sponges, or you think it's rhizarians, or you think it's just something else entirely? Okay. Right. That's a whole bunch of technical terminology. <laughs> let, let me couch it in more, more general terms. In, in the past few years, there have been various publications. Um, that, that suggests that, that the remains of the breakdown uh, compounds of, of biological tissues have been found in, in deep time, they're down below the base of the Cambrian. Uh, and some people uh, have suggested that these might represent sponges, other people have, have said that, that that's not feasible. Uh, Roz, mm. biomarkers in deep time, <laughs> feasible? Um, I mean, oh, uh, all I can do is reiterate what, what you have suggested, that they, they, they were initially proposed to be 100% a sponge biomarker and nothing else could make them. And this new discovery that the Rhizarians make them certainly throws some question mark over the, over the biomarker record, I guess. And it's, it, it, it is a question mark and we have to rethink quite what those biomarkers are showing us. We, we have to know which organisms can make yes. which biomarkers. Yes, and, I mean, it's a, it's, it's a tall order, right, when you're looking at biomarkers, trying to really, that, that, that we, that it's one of the real challenges of organic geochemistry, that you can go into the sediments, you can separate out, separate out molecules, you can look at the diversity of those molecules, but the biggest challenge for that field is making the link back to organisms, and, and we see the same thing when we're looking at algal assemblages of biomarkers that you know they're, they're almost never 100 percent a single organism and uh, and and the challenge is spanning the diversity of all forms of life to see what well, could anything else have made it oh. ali biomarkers yeah. in deep time wouldn't be good for your view of no uh, an abrupt um, explosion I think what Roz says is absolutely right. I mean, exclusivity is very hard to demonstrate. We need to find a, a chemical biomarker that nothing else can make except uh, an animal or a sponge in this case. And there's other problems working in deep time. These came from drill cores, uh, so there could have been contamination at any stage. Uh, we need to work out the dating of these sediments as well to have the, the age be believable. And I think uh, the recent study last year that suggests, well, uh, they're not exclusive to sponges, uh, was fairly uh, demonstrative of, of the fact that uh, it can't be seen as, as a, a smoking gun, as surefire evidence, 
that sponges were existing. Yeah. At and this they have time. been claimed for other groups as well. Yes. Uh, yeah. Yeah. Phil. Yeah, I agree. Yeah. The. Um... Well, this is very dull. So. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> We all agree. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so I, it's just one one character, right? It's not like anybody's found a sponge, mm. right? It's just one feature that we know that, that particular molecule is, is, a, is a, a breakdown product of organic molecules and there are different pathways to achieving it and different lineages are able to, to um, or their products can go through that same pathway. So it's an extremely ambiguous record. I, I don't think we can say that... Uh, we can't, I don't think we can dismiss it altogether. There is still a non-zero probability that it, it, it is indicative of sponges, but it's very close to zero. <laughs> Peter? No, I'll leave it at that. Right. <laughs> uh, a question right at the back. Hi. Um, I was wondering, from my memory of the Cambrian explosion and other fossils dating to the era, what was particularly special about it was the fossilization of soft-bodied, squishy, not hard-shelled um, animals. Um, surely you can say that the explosion or lack of explosion is due to just lack of sites with this perfect preservation of soft-bodied, because squishy things disappear. Um, so how do you incorporate and account for um, soft-bodied animals not being preserved or not necessarily seeing them in the fossil record. Can you extrapolate any kind of inference from that of what could be there or not there? So, so does the exceptional preservation of, uh, of soft tissues uh, inform our understanding of the Cambrian explosion and how does it inform it uh, in terms of presence or absence? Ali, if you start and then I'll go to Phil. Yeah, so I, I, I think maybe contrary to what people might just assume uh, is that preservation of fossils and soft tissues in particular is actually better as you go deeper in time uh, than it is, say, today or in more recent times. So in the Precambrian and the Cambrian, uh, we see huge numbers of many different styles of preservation, soft tissues preserved either as flattened carbon-rich films or in three dimensions, uh, in phosphate, in silica, various different modes. And we don't see most of these types of preservation occurring very often in the rock records, say, after the end of the Ordovician. So as you go more recently, you actually have a worse fossil record of soft tissues. Maybe that's sort of contrary to what you might think. Uh, and there are various reasons for this. We have certainly changes in, in ocean chemistry, uh, changes in terrestrial environments, all sorts of uh, global changes going on. But also, if animals are confined to uh, the evolution, if their evolution is generally confined to the Cambrian, uh, it could be the evolution of animals themselves that are closing this window of preservation. By that I mean, uh, as Peter talked about, we suddenly go from a 2D world to a 3D world. Animals are moving in the sediment, they're burrowing down, they're mixing up that sediment, uh, they're swimming in the water column. Uh, prior to that, we had essentially in the Ediacaran, nothing living in 3D, nothing mixing up that sediment, it was mat ground preservation. So animals themselves and their evolution and their ability to move in 3D could be partly what closed the preservation window. But preservation in the Precambrian is excellent. All the windows where we see animals in the Cambrian are open in the Precambrian, in the Ediacaran, and earlier, and no animals. So I think, from my point of view, reading the rock record and thinking about soft tissue preservation, it really is, is a, an extremely strong evidence for uh, being able to read the rock record close to literally and confining the Cambrian explosion to a real event that took place in the Cambrian. Phil, you spent your time with squishy animals. Yeah, I have. So you're right. You know, there are, you have these amazing sites of fossil preservation of squishy organisms in the Cambrian, but they're not really squishy. You know, there are, most of them have cuticle, right? And it's the cuticle itself that is preserved. And, you know, if you do decay experiments, you take a cuticularized animal, like a shrimp or something, and stick it in a bucket and watch it rot. And I've done that kind of thing, <laughs> you know. <laughs> Sorry. Uh, you, you end up with the cuticle left behind. The, these things, you know, they, they are, although they're soft tissue, they can quite commonly be fossilized. And uh, obviously, Ali's perfectly right. You go back into the Precambrian, and there are sites that have the same style of preservation. 
in the, in the Precambrian. There's a, a site in China that I've worked on where you have tinafores preserved. The, the most, you know, you wouldn't expect, tinafores are just bags of water, yeah? And yet they're preserved. So why is it in those deposits we don't find all the bilaterians that I'm telling you should be there based on the molecular clocks? And I think the reason why is because I'm not expecting to find um, mollusks. I'm not expecting to find arthropods. I'm expecting to find, you know, early representatives of the bioliteria, right? And um, those aren't going to look like anything like the living phyla, except for maybe one lineage. People have tried to infer the nature of the ancestral bioliterian and is invariably reconstructed as a flatworm-like organism. People have done rotting experiments on flatworms and there's nothing left at the end of it, right? There is no fossil record of flatworms, nothing, nothing at all. And people have even looked to see, well, okay, you know, they move around in sediment. Uh, is there a potential for their movement, their ecology to be preserved in the fossil record? And the answer is no. Yeah, they don't even leave traces of their movement through the, the, the substrate. So our expectations that people have independently come up with for the nature of deep ancestors within complex animals, um, are effectively met. We don't find them in the fossil record and we don't see traces of them either. Peter, how does the, the exceptionally preserved fossil record integrate with, with your view? Does it, does it add to the picture? And going to Phil's point, how do we recognise very primitive members of a phylum? We can make statements about what we expect the early members of, our, of a phylum will have, or, or indeed a larger clade, because we can compare between the living descendants and work out what they have in common and extrapolate back to the base. So if we think about, I mean, I've been stressing the bilateria, this, the, the majority of the animals with the left and the right sides of the body, which explore the world in three dimensions. So that's excluding things like jellyfish and sponges, etc. And those bilaterians, if we compare across modern bilaterians, we can infer that the first bilaterian most likely had some sort of central nervous system, a brain or, or condensation of nerves at the front end, some sort of sensor organs at the front end, a mouth, an anus, and muscle blocks. We can infer that's pretty likely that the common ancestor of all the living descendants had that. I don't know anything else about it, because all we can do is extrapolate back from those characteristic. So what I, I would anticipate it was a pretty mobile animal able to mix sediments um, in the way, that, um, the way that, both, that Ali spoke about and I spoke about. So that would be my inference, um, but I couldn't draw a picture of it. <laughs> <laughs> the question asked was about this concentration of cases of exceptional preservation of fossils around the Cambrian. Does that tie into your thinking about ocean chemistry? Well, I think it does in a, in a, in a very simplistic sense. You know, if, if, if you think going deeper into time, you're going to have, uh, well, it, it, coming on to this question, I suppose, of are you likely to preserve soft-bodied organisms as you go through the Cambrian explosion? Mm -hmm. And my, from a pure and simplistic geochemical approach, I would suggest that actually your preservation potential is going to decrease as you go through the Cambrian explosion. <laughs> Um, certainly if you're changing the oxygenation levels, uh, you're changing your potential for respiration of that organic carbon that's being generated by animals. So the lower the oxygen you have, the higher the, the preservation potential because you'll lower the respiration rates of that organic matter. So I guess it's, it's just reiterating what Alison is, is suggesting that she's saying the preservation windows are open through the Ediacaran and into the Cambrian, and, and if anything, as you have lower oxygen further back in time, you're likely to have better preservation, so. Hmm. Thanks very much. Let's take another question. We're exercising Vanessa. <laughs> um, so, I was I was wondering because we've we've certainly heard from both uh, Peter and Rosalind about um, the mechanism for, for the origin of animals. So I was wondering uh, what uh, Alison and Phil, what your thoughts are on what mechanism, reg regardless of whether uh, an uh, animals emerged at the beginning of the Cambrian or deep in the uh, Ediacaran or the Cryogenian, what do you two think the mechanism was for that process? <laughs> 
Phil, you go first this time. <laughs> <Yes>. <laughs> so in terms of geochemistry, timing becomes really important. And so it's, you know, the, the model that Ros and others have presented in the past is, is critical, right? Are the, the biological events that, that uh, we are saying are the consequence of geochemical changes, do they occur at the same time or after uh, those geochemical events, right? So it's a testable hypothesis. Uh, and at the moment, I, w I think most people who are formulating those hypotheses are taking a very literal view of the fossil record. Um, you know, much more literal than the, the very enlightened view that Ali's been presenting. Um, and, and I think, you know, the, the, it, it, I think it's necessary to take a more biological, more phylogenetic approach to test and refine those hypotheses of ca causality. Are they testing the origin of animals or are they testing the origin of bilaterians, for instance? Um, uh, but in terms of, of, of what, what made uh, animals animals, uh, what was the trigger? Um, my, I, I generally don't do why questions. Uh, and uh, history is just one damn thing after another. <laughs> Don't you say that as a 24-year-old postdoc, <laughs> <laughs> Ali? Um, I mean, I think you're getting back to the question we showed right at the, at the start of this event, these, these four factors and what was the trigger. I don't know, uh, and I don't know if we can ever say. I mean, certainly uh, we needed the genetic uh, sort of toolkit, developmental toolkit to build animals. Uh, we needed a permissive environment, so ocean geochemistry, of course, will have played a role. Uh, we see a period of change, you know, at the, the start of the Cambrian, we see um, water levels rising. This is following a massive erosional event, which would have brought lots of ions in, into the ocean. So certainly we also need there to be a permissive environment, which indeed was there, big shelves uh, with uh, an ocean rich in, in uh, ions and chemistry we need to build life. Uh, certainly once animals originated, they start interacting with each other, and ecology can also be a driver, at least for the radiation and not the origination. But it, exactly why it happened when it did and what was the trigger, I think, is, is uh, n not always the right question to ask. You need to sort of frame it in, in something that, that you, you can answer. So not just what caused the Cambrian explosion, but... Uh, you know, where do we see it on the continents? How did diversification happen? Then maybe you want to go to the rock record to, to answer that. Uh, if you want to talk about what could cause anatomical features to evolve, uh, you could look then at, at, at the more developmental side. You could think about rates of evolution. And again, you might want to go to different sources of data. It's such a complex interaction of all these things. And kind of what Phil said at the end is it happened when it happened because that's when it happened. And that's how evolution uh, took place. And so asking why it happened when it did, it, it's just, uh, it, I don't know why, maybe we never will, but it just, it did happen when it did. And thank goodness it did, right? <laughs> uh, Ross has a raised eyebrow next to me. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well, I mean, it's... It is. It's a challenging event to to understand. I guess. Um, what was I going to? I did have a. I, and and I think there is a, there is also a challenge that, as scientists, we try and justify our particular approaches. So if we're a geochemist, then our role is often reconstructing environmental ge geochemistry. And if we happen to see a change at the same time, then of course it's a driver. But, mm. and, but I would almost disagree with, with Phil. I'm not even sure that timing can tell us everything, but in, in the sense that I'm not sure the geological record and our various tools to interrogate the evolution through the geological record can ever resolve timing to the point of really saying what's a forcer and a driver and what's a responder. My suspicion is there are enormous positive feedbacks that need one little fluctuation to set them off. And you then go through the sort of ecosystem responses, geochemical changes. And I, I, my suspicion is you just need almost a chaotic stochastic perturbation to set the event off in, in motion. Peter? I don't think I have a lot to add, really. I, I mean, I'll, you know, I, in my talk, I really was stressing genetic changes. Yeah. But the genetic changes are only going to give the potential yeah. for all those feedbacks that we've just heard about, the ecological feedbacks, et cetera, in the correct environments to be there. So they do have to work together. <laughs>
There's a question I'm itching to ask, but we'll take one more from the floor. Anybody? The man in the green shirt. So we've heard um, uh, of the amazing different kinds of evidence that have been used to try and understand this time interval and what's been going on. So I wanted to ask each of you, uh, what piece of evidence would you like your keenest PhD student to knock on your door with that would really elucidate some of the gaps in our understanding of what, what was, what's been going on? You've not gone first yet, Peter, so... <laughs> <laughs> oh, goodness me. Um, I think the problem, and I'll, I'll focus on my, my research area entirely, which is what we know about what these genes do is based on our studies of particular species, which we then extrapolate. We actually need more information on, on testing functions of those genes in lots of different organisms. Then we can work out how much these genes are changing their functions over time and whether the sorts of things I'm talking about, which is there's a, set, there's a toolkit which does this job, and unless you have these genes, you can't build a gut or you can't build a nervous system. We need to, we can actually, te we can test that um, by doing comparative work in lots of different species, but it's going to take a long time to do that. Ali. Uh, I'm going to, my answer will be something that we will probably never be able to see, but I would love to have a Burgess Shale type biota discovered at like, you know, 530 or something, because we have a gap from the start of the Cambrian uh, until, which is 541, to 518 which is our first time we see uh, a full animal community, which is the Chenjiang biota. And these animals are all preserved as, as flattened films. And we see beautiful preservation of organ system, eyes, guts, nervous system, all the external features, absolutely amazing preservation of full animal communities at 518. So I'd love for a PhD student to say, hey, I was doing some field work and I found a new BST at 530. And then we see what animals are in there. Of course, it's probably well, never say never, but it seems like uh, very unlikely to happen because rocks of that type generally in that time period are, are not found. But people are finding new BSTs all the time. People are finding new Burgess Shale type localities uh, all around the world. Last year, there was a fantastic new one found in China, the Qingjiang biota, uh, different from the Chenjiang biota, uh, with, with a different sort of mode of preservation. So people are out there exploring, looking for these new localities all the time. And that would be like my dream uh, moment to, to, see, to see that happen. But I don't know if it ever will, unfortunately. So, Duncan, you were my keenest PhD student at one stage. <laughs> but, but I guess it's too late now. <laughs> uh, but, so the thing I want is either a, a genome of either Charnia or Dickinsonia or Kimberella. One of those. Just take your pick. <laughs> For us. Yeah, I think mine's, mine's similarly impossible. I want a little, I want a, a, an air bubble of, of, of Precambrian, Cambrian atmosphere to figure out what the oxygen levels were. And I'd quite like a little test tube of Precambrian, Cambrian seawater to <laughs> see what it is. I mean, you know, this, this is this, this, the world of indirect proxies where we try and read these things from signals and, and they always, the, the, the proxies emerge. People think they're wonderful, and then they say, no, they're not. And, and it, the, these incredible confidence in these proxies, and it, it would just be fabulous if we could figure out a way of actually having an atmospheric gas record that can, we, can take us beyond our ice cores. Our ice cores are fantastic for the last, last million years, but if we could find somewhere where there was old air and somewhere where there was old oh. seawater, that would just be phenomenal. The latter has been claimed. Of I course. know, I mean... Uh, whether you believe rights. water bubbles in salt... In well, the yes, I mean, there, yeah, that. exactly. There are inclusions in halite minerals which people interpret to be paleo seawater chemistry, but it's you're looking at an evaporite mineral that's presumably formed in an enclosed basin, and so all sorts of of questions are, are, are raised about that. But yeah, that's what, that's what I'd really like. Mm. There's an elephant-shaped question in this room that, that hasn't come from the audience, so I'll ask it. So one of the key differences between Phil's hypothesis uh, and your view of the Cambrian Explosion Alley um, is, is that molecular clocks tell us something uh, about the 
origin in deep time of, of, the, of animal groups. So where's your point of difference with Phil in, in terms of believing molecular clocks and, and, and what they're telling us? Mm. So I think molecular clocks have, uh, when they are well constrained, and we have to remember molecular clocks are constrained with fossils. So uh, they sort of are using fossils to give uh, minimum and maximum dates. So first of all, they are not completely independent of the fossil record. And depending on which evidence you believe uh, of, of the interpretation of fossils, if you use a, an animal calibration point in the Cambrian versus in the Ediacaran, it can affect the dates you're going to get uh, inferred from your molecular clock. So there, it's not really independent. Uh, but certainly, um, when it's well constrained, and I've, I've worked with um, molecular clock workers and published a paper related to the arthropod evolution on this, uh, when it's well constrained in the sort of upper parts of the trees, classes, orders, etc., uh, when you can have a definite maximum and minimum, uh, you have a very nice rock record because things are fairly easy to recognize. It seems to work very well, or at least it gives consistent answers with the rock record. Terrestrialization, for example, is what we were focused on. It gave sort of approximately uh, the same ages for terrestrialization for many arthropod lineages. Uh, going very, very deep uh, in the roots of, say, metazoa, bilateria, uh, we just don't have uh, animal fossils that are not yet identifiable to a phyla to calibrate the base of the clock. Uh, and there's been simulation studies by Graham Budd and others who suggested that also when you have uh, new uh, animals evolving, uh, or organisms in general, that this happens uh, very rapidly and uh, is very abundant, so that this could be giving a sort of uh, artifact problem where molecular clocks are overestimating divergence dates, particularly uh, in basal nodes. Okay, I'll come to Phil in a moment, but Peter, do you have a, a view on, from the um, genetics point of I view? I suppose I can add something to the, to, to just a, to a point of clarity, really. I mean, I talked a lot about genes, but the sorts of genes that I work on and have worked on for more than 25 years, these genes that pattern the embryo, are not the same sorts of genes that Phil is using to build those clocks, OK? And the sorts of genes that I work on are the least clock-like genes you could ever... The least clock-like things you'd ever... If, I, you, if you had a clock like that, you'd throw it away, <laughs> because the, they're, the sorts of genes I work on, they're, their mutation rates change, they're, they're diverging all over the place, they're shooting, they're changing, they're staying still, and then they're changing for a few million years, they go all over the place. So the sorts of genes I work on don't behave like clocks. Now, having said that, I just want to be clear that the sorts of genes that, that are used to build those molecular clocks do behave in a pretty clock-like way. Um, so although, personally, as a molecular biologist, I have a little bit of nervousness about molecular clocks because I've seen so many genes behave in a non-clock-like way. I also accept that the people who do build the clocks do it in a very, very careful way. Mm. So, you know, we, we can't, I'm not just going to throw them away. They do them in a very, very careful way. If you read their papers, including Phil's papers, <laughs> extremely careful. <laughs> and, you know, we are left with a bit of a dilemma because the fossil record just doesn't quite look like the timings in those clocks, to my mind. Is there a fragility? Uh, I don't know. I'm not going to answer that question. I'm going to answer the, answer the one you asked me at the beginning. <laughs> <laughs> so... I thought I was chairing. Yeah, mm -hmm. too bad. So, <laughs> so I, Ali pointed out, right, the, the molecular clock isn't independent from the fossil record, right? And, and that's, I, I said that at the beginning, it is an integrative method for taking all of the data, all of the pertinent data. We have these two independent records of evolutionary history, right? Which is the genes in the cells in, of our body and the cells of all other animals' bodies as well. They record all of evolutionary history, back down to the last universal common ancestor of all of life and beyond. And then we have the fossil record as well, right? And the clocks bring all that together. Now, molecular clocks, they can only explore possible ages, you know, when they're estimating the age of a clade, they can only uh, consider ages that, that lie within the constraints that you put in at the beginning. And those constraints are based on both the fossil record and the geological record as well, and, and phylogenetic evidence. It's a, it's a whole big hot mess that's all integrated together. 
right? Uh, and some of those, as Ali's pointed out, are very, very uncertain, right? And that, express, that just shows the fact that the fossil record is very uncertain. And, and uh, the constraints that we place on many of these nodes are very loose because uh, in Ali's view, the fossil record is a close approximation of the true antiquity of evolutionary lineages. But there are other people who actually think that animals evolved more than 600 million years ago. You know, based on, uh, Ross showed them images of, of fossils that look like the embryos of animals. I don't believe that they're uh, the embryos of animals, but I have to consider that there is a non-zero probability that they're right. Yeah? And so the, the evolutionary model and the molecular sequence data do their work trying to constrain the true time uh, of origin within those constraints. I can, not tomorrow, because the analyses take too long, but next week, certainly, I could give you a time scale that fits exactly what Ali thinks, right? But what we, do, we, what we try to do is to take uh, the uh, most conservative interpretation of the fossil record possible and leave the evolutionary models and uh, the molecular sequence data to do their work. I am uncomfortable with the relationship between the fossil record and what molecular clocks tell us, but that's science, isn't it? You know, I, I, I can deal with two incompatible uh, bits of, of data, and that prompts me to do new research. Yeah. Um, I'm going to turn to Ros in a moment, but if we just put the, the Mentimeter screen up, uh, whilst uh, Ros comments, could, could you, we've got to eight o'clock, so uh, if you wouldn't mind voting again, we'd be quite interested what, what comes out of it. Ros. <laughs> Well, I just I wanted to ask Peter about the comment to regarding the molecular clocks. But when you have your innovation of mm. over a thousand genes on those particular branches, is that such an exceptional innovation of genetic diversity that it could actually raise questions about the conservative estimates of molecular clock rates through that time scale? It, well, there's two parts to that question. It's an exceptional number of additional genes to arise on a particular internode because most of the other branches are about 300, not 1,500. So something jumped. It doesn't mean things happen more quickly, though, mm. because there's sort of, we, you know, we don't know the length intervals of each of those nodes. So we, we're not saying that genes necessarily arose more quickly in that time. We're just saying, actually, there are a lot of new things there for an animal and there's a lot of new things there for a bilaterium. How does it affect clocks? I'm not sure we should equate the two because the genes which are being used to build the clocks are not those genes. Okay, um, I'm conscious that we, we've run out of time, sadly, but uh, I've certainly en enjoyed this evening. Darwin was mightily puzzled by the appearance of fossils at the base of the Cambrian, um, and in some ways not much has changed since he wrote on the origin of species. As we've heard tonight, we, we understand a lot more but it, as ever in science, it's opened a huge range of additional questions. Uh, so I'm sure we could have another of these debates um, in 10, 50, 100 years, uh, and there would still be big questions. But very many thanks to all of the panel for uh, very lucid uh, presentations and, and answers to questions. Uh, and many thanks to all of you for coming. If you've not seen the exhibition, then please do. All those squidgy fossils are on display until September. Thanks very much. Thank you.